Good morning and welcome to To The Point. We take a break from state politics. We've been covering that very closely over the past few weeks, and we will return to that. There's a lot going on there, but nothing like what's going on in Washington, D.C. We're happy to have with us this morning Congressman Fred Upton. Fred, as you prefer to be called, it is oh, nice to have you back here. Good to be here. And it's, you know, this is kind of interesting, and a little bit inside baseball. It is much harder to do shows about federal issues now because things happen so quickly. With a mere tweet, things in Washington change pretty dramatically. So thank you for coming in very late in the week in order for us to do something that's topical. Let's start with something that everybody's heard about, everybody knows about, and it is controversial no matter which side of this you are on, and that is the president declaring an emergency so he could use funds otherwise not appropriated for the wall that he promised to build during his campaign. You voted to oppose that and to say, no, you can't do that. And there is going to be a vote coming up on Tuesday for a veto override, which is a little unusual. It doesn't happen very often. I'm going to make the prediction it's not going to happen this time. I don't think the votes are there. But let's talk about where you are on this. What is, what is from your perspective, the problem with the president saying, this is an emergency and I'm going to use these funds? Very good question. So I have a long history of supporting both funds for border security and a physical wall. And we passed that with uh, President Obama and we passed that with President Trump. Uh, that's, not the, that's not the issue as, as I see it here. It's his use of the emergency declaration. So in the past, and it's been used before, in the past when any president has made a, an emergency declaration, Ebola, swine flu, hurricanes, all right? Money isn't, you know, didn't expect it to happen. You've got to reprogram money. Uh, it comes in the middle of the fiscal year. There's never a good day for it. But there's been a concurrence, a sign-off by both Republicans and Democrats on the appropriate appropriation subcommittee. And they check the box, yes, it's okay. Usually not a lot of money, but it could be, I don't know, hundreds of millions or whatever. This is billions. So what the president is doing now is even though we, we passed, more, you know, about $2 billion for border security as part of the uh, continuing resolution and back th in this February. Is, this is when government opened back up. That's that right. was part of the it, deal. That's exactly right. Even though, so we passed it then. The president says, no, I'm going to have additional money now, and I'm going to take it from defense. I'm going to take it from a variety of different pots that you, the Congress, has already signed off on. And by the way, I'm not going to get your concurrence. We're not sending it up to get the support of the Republican and Democrat uh, leader of that ap appropriate subcommittee. We're just going to do it. So it is a real grab of power and sets, I think, a terrible precedent, particularly for the future. Let's say you've got a, you know, very, I'm a you know, Republican. Let's say you have a very liberal Democrat. At some point, you're going to have that. And let's say he or she says, oh, we're going to pick a different cause for us and we're going to take money from agriculture or defense or something else, <clears throat> something that Congress has appropri appropriated the money for, and without their consent, just take it. And that is, that is the real crux of the issue here. So that is why a number of us in the House uh, did vote no, or, or we voted yes on a motion of disapproval. And that's why even in the Republican Senate now, two, a couple weeks ago, uh, 12 members of the Senate, including the former whip, Roy Blunt, Rob Portman, who was a senior, you know, cabinet official under President uh, uh, Bush. I mean, all. I mean, we've we've said no. This is not the w right way to govern, and sets a it's a, a bad precedent. You're right in your judgment, and that when the vote occurs on Tuesday, we will not have the votes to override in the House. We're going to have. You need 290 if everybody's there. We'll have probably about 250, uh, so we'll be about 40 votes short. But then it's going to go to the courts. We'll see how they how they decide. So let's dig into this a little deeper, and there are other issues we want to talk about, but I think this is important because for as long as I can remember, the phrase has always been, the president proposes and Congress disposes. Congress, the House specifically, Article 1, has the, the right to spend and appropriate money, and it, and it lists... It is specifically with Congress, not with the executive branch. And that's part of this argument. Well, that is. And we have, you know, our founding fathers, great people, when they designed the Constitution, we have three equal, equal branches of government. We don't have a king. And Article I in the Constitution makes it very clear that <coughs> on 
tax and spending issues, it's the Congress that initiates that action. So in essence, what President Trump is doing, he's doing an end around on and taking money for other purposes without our sign off. And again, I support money <clears throat> for the wall and have a long history of doing that and border security. But this is not this is this procedure is what's wrong and why I will vote to override on Tuesday. But that creates um, a different issue. For example, Senator Blunt, you were talking about, I was just reading yesterday from, I think from his home county, he was uninvited to come speak at their Lincoln Day dinner. Um, within the Republican Party, the politics of this is not always easy for people to appreciate or understand because there are a lot of people that believe that Congress has not given the president what he asked for in terms of money for the wall, which is, by the way, the prerogative of Congress. But for Republicans who voted against this, it creates some problems. Well, it, it may do that. But, you know, I, <clears throat> I have a long history of uh, supporting a, a president regardless of party when I think that he's right or opposing him regardless of party when I think that he's wrong. As I look at my career, and you've watched it a long time. We've had, we've been, I've been on the show a lot of years. You sure have. <laughs> But, you know, I, used, I once worked for President Reagan, and I talked to his former chief of staff, in fact, a little bit earlier this week, Ken Duberstein, uh, and we talked about this vote. But, you know, I got to say that one of my first votes that I cast was actually voting to override a veto of my boss, President Reagan, on the highway bill. You know, he, he, that was one of his first vetoes that he did when I was first elected. And I said, you know, we need our roads. All, all of this money is being funded by the, the uh, highway tax, uh, the, the gas tax out of the highway trust fund. And we ought to spend it for roads and bridges and, and highways. And it was overridden. Uh, maybe Jack Kemp voted no. <laughs> uh, he always took, you know, but uh, it was overwhelmingly. And, you know, President Reagan didn't, didn't survive that. But, you know, I, as I think back about different presidents, uh, yeah, I'm not a rubber stamp. I want to. I want to vote on the merits of the issue. And on this one, uh, I join a number of Republicans. Jim Sensenbrenner, very conservative, former, former chairman of the, of the Judiciary, Judiciary Committee. He was one of those that said, you know, this is a violation of the Constitution. And again, when you think about the precedent that it sets, I mean, for me, picture a uh, Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, and, and you know, if if they're there or anybody else, you know, 20 years down the road, this is a bad thing which also then shows why we need to fix it and that's where we're going next so in addition to voting and saying I don't like this idea in addition to voting few looking forward to override the veto you and the problem solvers group are looking at rewriting the statute so the president will have a much narrower range of what they can use this emergency power for. That's right. So Problem Solvers, of course, is a bipartisan caucus, equally divided between Republicans and Democrats. We were successful in changing the rules of the House, this, this Congress, um, by threatening the Speaker that she wouldn't have the votes. I mean, we would have done the same thing on the Republican side if it had been a Republican. She concurred to get the votes to become Speaker. And we now have a rules change. We've already seen some of these things happen on campaign finance reform. But now as we look at changing the rules on the emergency procedure, it is to really involve the Congress for sure that when a president may declare an emergency uh, declaration, that you're going to have a period of 30 or 60 days to get the concurrence of both bodies, House and Senate, to sign off on it. Uh, so that you can't willy-nilly take money from one pot and use it for the other. And the same idea, now we've, we've shared it with our Senate colleagues. There, Rand Paul, Mike Lee, some very prominent Republican constitutional uh, senators, very much like that idea. And I would dare say that you, we may see some legs on this. And again, bipartisan proposal. I don't know whether the president's going to like it or not, but it could be pretty overwhelming on both sides. And very much what happened with the War Powers Act back in the 70s, back when you and I were in elementary school. Uh, <laughs> but again, it, 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 you know, it's the same type of structure that the president cannot declare war or put our troops in harm's way without the concurrence of the Congress within 30 or 60 days. This is patterned after that. I want to talk more uh, about the president's budget in detail, but before we do, we've got about a minute and a half left in this segment. Talk to me about the environment in Washington, because 
This administration is unique, I think, to, to be a fair characterization, and it has kind of changed Washington overall, at least from the observer outside looking in. You're one who has been there from Reagan right through to today. How is it different for you as you pursue policy and objectives that you would like to get done? Well, first of all, I prefer to have a Republican gavel as <laughs> speaker. Let me make that really clear. But, you know, when I was first elected, coming from President Reagan, and, you know, I was in charge of congressional affairs at the Office of Management Budget, he got a lot done. Uh, he had a Democratic Congress, uh, Speaker Tip O'Neill, you know, was, uh, Senate, I don't remember who. <laughs> but Mike long Mansfield. Yeah, yeah, probably, could, yep. But, you know, he got a lot done because he worked with both sides. And so when I was first elected, I said, huh, I, I'd never been in, you know, my lifetime, Republicans had, had not been in the majority in the House. I said, but I'm always going to work with the Democrats to try and get things done. I'm here to, you know, as a policy person. So, and I've maintained that whether I've been in the majority or the minority. And, you know, that's what, you know, the uh, Speaker Pelosi now, she has actually a, a pretty small margin. And she's got a pretty progressive left that are not a majority within her, her caucus, but they can do the same thing that the Freedom Caucus did on the, on the Republican side. So her margin is only 17 or 18 votes. So it is tough for her, which then really propels groups like the Problem Solvers, a bipartisan group, to really have an oar in the water to try and get things done. And it's, you know, we have a lot of issues. We went through some tough times with the shutdown, that's for sure. And now we're, we're off to the races again. And one of the issues will be the Great Lakes. When we come back in just a moment, we're going to talk about why the president's budget, again, defunds an important program for the Great Lakes, including Lake Michigan and others. We'll do all that when we come back to The Point. Welcome back to To The Point. Congressman Fred Upton is here with us. Let's talk a little bit about what is about to happen because the president has put forward a budget and within that budget there are a number of things that you and I were just discussing that are troublesome for you. And I'm going to start oh, with one, more than that. <laughs> one that you have already uh, weighed in on and it won't be the first time that you've weighed in on it as have most of your colleagues from Michigan and other Great Lakes states and it's the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. It is about 300 million dollars and, and I say this I don't mean to be flip but in a multi-trillion dollar budget it's a rounding That's error. That's right. Um, but each year that the president, this president, has put a budget forth he has almost zeroed it out. This year I think 90 percent of yeah. it get, gets cut out. Uh, what are you and your colleagues prepared to do? Because as you pointed out, this is money that would be used for things, oh, I don't know, like trying to keep Asian carp out of well, the Great Lakes. Time. This is so important. So the Asian carp, even second graders understand what Asian carp would do to the Great Lakes, you know. And I spoke to some the other day and I was sort of sorry because for the next 20 minutes I couldn't get them off the topic. Uh, but it, it would be tragic for our state, not only water quality, but all the things that they do. And I've, you know, I've been out some of the research votes, uh, research vessels that we have, and it, it's incredible what's happening, and you don't want to take a step back. And just like it's important here, he also eliminated the Chesapeake uh, Bay uh, money. I mean, it's just, so we're together. We have a good consensus, Republicans and Democrats. We now have two members from Michigan on the Appropriations Committee, John Molinar being one of them from Midland, and we are going to work to make sure that there won't be a penny cut um, in this very important fund. Uh, we, it would be terrible economic losses to our whole region, but we together, you know, you take Wisconsin and Minnesota, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, New York, Pennsylvania, we're united, very few defections in terms of making sure that we stand up for this money. You mentioned the Chesapeake Bay, and I, I would just highlight that for a minute because for decades, the Chesapeake Bay watershed has been a, a real focus to clean up not just the bay, but everything that feeds into the bay. So like the Great Lakes, yeah, uh, they have worked uh, strategically to try to protect their sources uh, uh, of fresh water within the region. Uh, and of course, we have the largest repository here. You've been successful 
every year up until now, you feel as confident this year? I do. So, you know, we're at the end, and this is a little different than if you watch Lansing, what you, of course, do. The governor of Michigan signs the budget. I right. mean, that's the big th issue. The budget in the Congress never gets signed or vetoed by the president. We have a whole different system. But so you have to then really rely on the appropriators, the ones that actually put the line item money in for the budget, for the their appropriate bills. And we are going to make sure that that money is there. And I won't vote for an appropriation bill if they zero this money out. Let's talk about something else that you brought to my attention. Uh, we talked extensively. Uh, you, uh, Representative uh, Diana uh, Deget. Deget, came uh, to Kalamazoo. Uh, I know you went to Denver with her as well. You worked on something called the 21st Century Cures. It is something that was a bipartisan issue that was signed by President Obama before he left office. And it expands research, among other things. It also allows for both uh, drugs and devices to come to the market more quickly so people get quicker relief and we have more development here in the United States. This budget would impact that because it defunds some of the research that you and your Democratic counterparts work to get in this. How does, how does this budget impact that? Well, it's really a big step back. So Speaker Ryan, Paul Ryan, when we moved our bill, which was immensely popular and bipartisan, both the House and the Senate, we expanded health research by $45 billion over a 10-year span. And when we did that, Paul Ryan, very strong fiscal conservative, said, Upton, when you do that, and that's fine with me, you need to find offsets. You know, you get real offsets, not smoke and mirrors, but you have to find things that we're actually going to reduce and use those savings to go to medical research, something that most of us support. And of course, here in Grand Rapids, uh, big, big initiatives. We had a hearing just last week, sickle cell. We may cure that in the next year or two. It may be done. You look at cystic fibrosis, you look at cancer, you look at all these diseases where we made wonderful progress since this bill got signed into law because of what we did, uh, T cells and everything else. The budget that the president proposed takes us off that glide path that goes up 45 billion over 10 years and actually takes it below current spending. A reduction just next year of four and a half billion dollars from what we added. So it's, uh, it's, 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 a <laughs> it, it, it's a proposal that's going to go nowhere. I mean, we had a hearing on it last week. Yes, there are some small increases, 50 million for childhood cancer. Uh, he has a big proposal on ending HIV. Uh, those are good things, but you cannot take us off this uh, track, uh, our researchers and others, if we're going to ever find a cure for these diseases. Alzheimer's, I mean, the, the list is a long one. One of the things that when you, when you think about, again, and I kind of go back to where we ended the last segment, there is this, this pull, particularly among conservatives in the Republican Party, um, who oppose more government spending, yet government spending increases on a regular basis. And when you talk about budgeting, as you were talking about earlier, this budget, no matter what it looks like, is more money than it was before, and it will not go through a regular process. There's not going to be a regular budget done. There'll be another continuing resolution. Yeah, there will right? be. I mean, there will be. <laughs> so, I mean, a, a, a lot of this conversation uh, is about setting priorities, but because of the matchup between Republicans and Democrats, getting uh, a new solid budget is just not in the works. Yeah, you're not, in my view, you're not going to see it. They're, they're going to go through the drill for a little bit, but I'll bet within a couple of weeks, they'll throw in the towel. They'll say, you know what, we just can't get it done. And for the Democrats, I mean, you know, they've got the, the progressive left. I mean, they're not going to, I mean, you, you just, you can't get a 218 vote consensus with the margin so small. And remembering that this actually never goes to the president for his signature. And it's the same issue in the Republican-controlled Senate. Margin is pretty close, six, seven votes. They're not going to be able to get it done either, let alone get a compromise and come back for a vote, when in essence the appropriators are going to deem what the levels of spending are really going to be. There are a couple of other things in here that uh, we've heard about, but... And again, given the fact that this budget is probably nothing more than a statement so, of priorities. Fun, fun, fun little story. Remember, I, I worked at the budget office right. under President Reagan. 
So back then the budgets were a little bit more relevant. You actually had the full hearings and everything else. So to show that our budget, the Reagan budget, was not dead on arrival, this, you know, everyone now uses that. We actually sent, um, we rented white coats. <laughs> we rented an ambulance, or we borrowed one, I don't know, didn't rent one, probably no one paid for it. And we drove the budget up and we put it on a striker stretcher and we were giving it, you know, resuscitation and we, we wheeled it through the halls of the Capitol just, just to show that the budget wasn't dead on arrival. But that was a little little bit of a hijinks. Well, there, there was some, but this one really is. Yeah, there was, there was a fair amount of theater in the Reagan uh, presidency. I remember we were at one point standing behind a mountain of paper that was the budget. Yeah. We had it all laid yeah. up yeah. That was um, in Congress. So, so there was a time when it was more of a process, but now it seems that it's just a matter of continuing current spending and that's yeah and you know what frankly the budget process needs to be reformed we almost were able to do it last year there's a bipartisan commission they came very close to getting it done but frankly we ought to be looking at a two-year budget instead of a one-year budget so you use that second year for oversight you, you try to um, we and we do multi-year uh, appropriation bills as well because you know it's so complex it's trillions of dollars um, you just you need more time to work on this thing, and a, a two-year budget would make a lot more sense. One of the things that strikes fear in the hearts of people is when they hear about cuts to either Medicaid Ooh, or Medicare. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it, it is, uh, in large measure, the third rail of politics, like Social Security. Uh, this budget, again, not that it's reality, but this budget would impact that. Well, it would, and if you remember from the presidential campaign, President Trump, um, candidate Trump, said, I'm not going to touch Medicare and Medicaid. And he must not have looked at this budget because there are billions of dollars of cuts to providers, hospitals, doctors, that if they were implemented would, I think, deny lots of, you know, lots of Americans access to care that they're expecting. So again, those budget cuts on Medicare and Medicaid they're not going to go anyplace, nor should they, and, and frankly would violate a promise, a pledge, that uh, candidate uh, Trump said when he was running for president two years ago. About a minute and a half left. There is one other area that would be impacted, and I think sometimes we tend to forget how big agriculture is in Michigan, but it's a big deal. And federal support, and I'm not talking about laying fields fallow and paying for that as once was the practice, but federal support for things like crop insurance and other things could be impacted, again, for a budget that is not going to be passed. That's right. You know, the farm bill that the president took credit for, as he should, he signed it into law in, in December, it was bipartisan, and I was pleased to support it. I think most of our delegation uh, voted for it. It included some good reforms on crop insurance, and so we came through, this is a particularly hard winner. And I tell you, our peach crop is really threatened because it was so cold for so long that uh, fruit that has pits in it, peaches, may not be able to survive at least the growing season this year. We'll see. You know, it's a little bit early yet. But they're going to be protected because, for the most part, many of them had crop insurance for exactly this. They paid insurance or premiums, and the Trump budget does reduce the premiums uh, or the uh, changes the, the percentage dramatically. Those changes were rejected in the in the conference for the farm bill, and they'll be they were in his budget, but they're not going to be coming through. As always, thank you for your time for being here. I'm sorry we're out of time. I'll be back with a final note next to the point. In Washington, the conversation about the budget may continue, but in Lansing, they'll have to get a budget done. And when we come back next week, we'll talk more about that when you join us to the point.